As you can see from my other YouTube videos, I've been very interested in the golden ratio at Fibonacci for some years now. And the reason that it interests me so much is that the golden ratio seems to pop up everywhere in the natural world, from hurricanes and cyclones to the double helix shape of DNA, from the large scale structure of entire galaxies, down to the forces at work in physics. But really, as far as how the golden ratio is used in the natural world, the list just goes on and on and on. And of course, the most beautiful geometric shape that demonstrates the golden ratio is the pentagram star and the pentagon itself. By way of progression, this got me interested in the dodecahedron, which is made up of 12 pentagons. I figured that this would have to be a good starting point for me to learn about the golden ratio in the three-dimensional world. But then I heard about the Buckminster Fullerene, or C60, that is 60 carbon atoms locked together into the shape of a truncated icosahedron, more commonly known as the shape of a soccer ball. Now when it comes to polyhedra shapes, there's a little thing called duality. If you want to know more about duality, there's lots of YouTube videos about it. But with the Buckminster Fullerene, or C60, the truncated icosahedron, it has a dual, and that dual is the Pentarchus dodecahedron. This shape here is the Pentarchus dodecahedron, which, as you can see, has 60 equilateral triangle faces. Now, I accidentally stumbled onto the shape of the Pentarchus dodecahedron when I built this model. And what it is, is a normal dodecahedron in the center that has been fractaled. What we end up with is 12 interlocked stellated dodecahedrons, which neatly fit inside of the Pentarchus dodecahedron, which has the 60 equilateral triangle faces. And of course, the dual of the Pentarchus dodecahedron is the truncated icosahedron, which is the same shape as the recently discovered C60 carbon molecule. So then I stopped and thought about C60, the carbon molecule that is made up of 60 carbon atoms. Wouldn't it make the most sense that if 60 carbon atoms can be arranged to form this truncated icosahedron shape, then wouldn't it make the most sense for the atoms themselves to also be made up of building blocks, or at the very least, the laws of physics that govern atomic structure must likewise be governed by the principles of the golden ratio and Fibonacci in order to come up with this shape. Of course, a single carbon atom is made up of six protons and six neutrons, a nucleus of 12, which again can easily form a dodecahedron. But what if a proton itself was a dodecahedron? Could this make sense? Some years ago, long before I had any interest in atomic structures, I built this model starting with a blue stellated icosahedron in the middle, which is encased in the dodecahedron in green. If we then turn the dodecahedron into a stellated dodecahedron, we again come to an icosahedron with this one stellation. So as you can see, this geometric process can continue indefinitely bigger or smaller. And so using this model, I built a theoretical model of a hydrogen atom. So although, as you can see there, it's much smaller than the original, you can see that it does follow the same geometric structure. So let's take a closer look. So a hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. Of course, this is not to scale. If it were to scale in a hydrogen atom of this size, the proton itself would be a barely visible speck in the middle there. So now, let's talk about electron orbitals. An electron orbital is the region of space around an atom where the electron travels around the nucleus. So I built another model which slips over the top to show what an electron orbital might look like. 
As you can see, the proton is not directly in the centre of the orbital. Electrons can more accurately be described as following the path of a comet around the Sun, rather than a circular orbit like the Earth. Of course, the electron spins around the nucleus in every direction, and so it gives the appearance of a sphere in the case of the hydrogen atom. So how would this work in more complicated atoms? So then I learned more about electrons and how they are arranged in an orderly way around a nucleus. In larger atoms, electrons are located at various distances from the nucleus. These regions are referred to as electron shells, and each shell has a varying number of subshells. Of course, all of this got very confusing very quickly, so I created my own periodic table of elements that demonstrates each element and shows more easily how many electrons there are in each shell and each subshell. So if we take a look at the most complex electrons over here, we can see a clearly recognizable pattern. In the first four shells, K, L, M, and N, there are two, eight, 18 and 32 electrons respectively. But the interesting thing is what is happening in the subshells. The first shell, K, has two electrons. The second has two and six. The third has two, six and 10. The fourth has two, six, 10 and 14. And that pattern continues. Now there was something about the arrangement of these electrons that was far too similar to the Fibonacci sequence to be coincidental. So then I thought, would electron shells fit with my original model of a stellated icosahedron encased in a stellated dodecahedron, which is again encased in a stellated icosahedron? Would dodecahedral protons generate forces that follow this geometric pattern? If it does, what would the seven electron shells look like? Of course, Fibonacci gets really big really quickly. So to build a model, I had to start with the absolute smallest stellated icosahedron that I could build. And so what are we looking here? As you can see in the middle, there's a tiny icosahedron that's been partially stellated, and it's sitting inside of a dodecahedron that has been stellated, and that is again sitting inside of a stellated icosahedron, and that pattern continues. So with the first icosahedron, the first stellation, represents the first electron shell K. The second stellation here represents the second electron shell L, which has its two subshells S and P. The third stellation represents the third atomic shell M, and it has its three subshells S, P and D. So to continue on from our third M atomic shell there, I had to turn the whole model around. So continuing on, on the fourth atomic shell, we have N, and it has its four uh, subshells, S, P, D, and F. So continuing on from our fourth atomic shell N, we had to zoom out a little bit, and now we've got the fifth atomic shell, O. It's probably getting a little bit small, the writing now to see, but it has five subshells, S, P, D, F, and G. If we were then to continue on from our fifth uh, atomic shell, O, we then come to our atomic shell, P, and it has its six subshells, S, P, D, F, G, and H. 
And so finally, if we move on from our sixth atomic shell, P, we get up to our seventh atomic shell, Q. But we might just stop there and zoom in a little bit more. So here we have atomic shell, Q, and atomic shell, Q, has seven subshells, S, P, D, F, G, H, and I. So taking a step back and looking at the overall model, could the structure of an atom actually follow this geometric pattern, starting with an icosahedron that's been stellated into a stellated dodecahedron, back into a stellated icosahedron, and so forth. So now if we go back to carbon-60, the recently discovered C60 molecule, can a molecule like this, made up of 60 carbon atoms, self-assemble into this complex geometric structure if the laws of physics themselves are not somehow governed by the golden ratio and Fibonacci as well? Of course, you'll be told that molecules form due to properties of chemical attraction between elements, and this is true. But there's a whole field of study devoted to it. It's called molecular geometry. What that means is that the various elements on the periodic table form molecules based on the geometric laws that govern the relative position of their electrons. So what they're saying, without saying it, is that geometric laws are crucial to our understanding of the structure of atoms. So imagine for a moment that a proton and a neutron are dodecahedral by nature. Here we would then have a helium nucleus made up of two protons and two neutrons. But what would the overall atom look like? following the geometric structure that we've looked at, perhaps the forces generated by the nucleus would look something like this, with the electron orbitals looking something like these. Here we have what a carbon atom nucleus might look like. The carbon atom nucleus has six protons and six neutrons. But what would the overall atomic structure look like? Originally, I built this structure to demonstrate the six electron orbitals of the carbon atom. So here you can see two electrons in the first K shell. Here you can see two electrons in the subshell of the L orbital and another two electrons in the 2P subshell. But as much as I like this model, I didn't really like the fact that it, you couldn't see what the actual positions of the electron orbitals were. So I built another model. So based on the same geometric proportions of the previous model, I built this model to show what the actual orbitals would look like on a carbon atom. And as you can see, they are in agreement with the current understanding of what the orbitals actually do look like. Of course, what we've talked about here today in reality is only theoretical, but it really is something that I believe is worth thinking about.